Kate Newman. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at Flexor, which is the Innovation Centre at the heart of Clearing's the Technology Creative Campus. 18 months ago, I stood here to open the inaugural Pleasure to Make event, which was great for the um, for the then Chancellor and now the um, Prime Minister. And I'm delighted to be able to do the video before we go to the For an event that's going to be discussing driving growth across green industries, Flexor feels like the perfect location. Flexor is an innovation company that has environmental sustainability in its, in its heritage since inception. Over the last six years, since our launch, we've worked in the areas of carbon capture, smart homes, electrification, and connected um, mobility. We've also worked on complex net zero innovation challenges, working with startups, industry, and government. Hosting this event feels like a really key moment in Flexor's journey. And I couldn't be more proud that we're able yet again to play a very small part in the evolution of the Treasury Connect series of events. For now, I'd like to welcome the Chancellor of the Senate. Thank you very much indeed, Kate, for hosting us. And um, I wasn't here um, 18 months ago, I was actually here 10 years ago when I was. Culture Secretary responsible for the Olympics, and this was the Media Centre. Um, and it is a source of incredible pride that this has just taken off in a way that I don't think anyone would have imagined um, as a hub of tech innovation. And, uh, and I think everyone associated with London 2012 feels incredibly proud of what's happened. Um, my best memory of the Olympics, if you'll indulge me for one moment, was. Um, the fact that the Sydney Morning Herald decided at the very start of the Olympics to put on their front page a running tally of who got more gold medals, Team GB or Team Australia. Yeah. And as you may remember, we did rather well. And in fact, there wasn't a single day in which we didn't have more gold medals than Team Australia. And one of their journalists at the end rather gamely said it was the best example in history of something that seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, Anyway, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, this is a very, very important conference for the government, and I'll explain why. Um, I've got with me uh, two secretaries of state, Therese Coffey and Grant Shapps. Um, I've also got uh, four ministers uh, from the Treasury, Baroness Penn, James Cartledge, and uh, well, I've got Graham Stewart from the Department of Energy and Net Zero. Have I missed out a minister? I think I've got well, anyway, we've got sectors of state and ministers galore. And the reason is because for the UK, our green industries are absolutely strategic. Uh, this is an area where we are extremely proud of the progress that has been made uh, really over the last two decades. Um, but if I think back to uh, when I was responsible for the Olympics, we just looked at what's been happening over the last decade. The UK has confirmed its spot as the major country that has done most to reduce emissions, uh, broadly since 1990, which is the benchmark. Our economy has nearly doubled and our emissions have nearly halved, which is a very, very strong record that we can be proud of. We were the first major country to legislate for net zero. Over 90% of our economy is now covered by net zero targets. And at the same time, we have this huge uh, sector of our economy employing 430,000 people worth 41 billion pounds. Uh, London has become the global center for sustainable finance. And we're delighted that we have the governor of the Bank of England here as part of today's conference. And um, if we just look at what happened last year, around 40% of our electricity comes from renewables. 28th of December was our greenest day ever. And the 30th of December, particularly blustery December day, 60% of our energy came from wind. 60% of our electricity, I should say, came from wind, which is a huge step forward. We are, um, after China, the second largest producer of wind energy in the world and only behind Germany in Europe in the proportion of our energy that comes from renewables. So this is a really important industry for us. And it's important for me as Chancellor because it is part of a bigger strategy. If you were to say 
how on earth is the UK going to pay for the National Health Service, uh, remain Europe's largest defender of democracy, and keep taxes low over the next 10, 20, or 30 years? I would say the answer is because we have incredible strengths in innovation industries. And if we play our cards cleverly, we can turn the UK into the world's next Silicon Valley. Green industries is a very important part of that, but I could also point to our technology industry, where last year we became only the third country in the world to have a billion dollar tech sector, more unicorns than France and Germany combined. Um, I could talk about our advanced manufacturing industry, where we make half of the world's aircraft wings, a quarter of the world's small satellites. I could talk about our creative industries, uh, where, which have been growing at twice the rate of the economy as a whole. And I could talk about our life sciences industries, where every single one of the world's 25 leading life sciences companies has an office here. We were responsible for one of the world's two biggest vaccines, the world's biggest treatment for COVID. So we have incredible strengths. But what gives us optimism that we can take all these ingredients and turn them into uh, us being a science and innovation superpower, being that world's next Silicon Valley, is that behind the incredible innovation that you see in this building and the companies you represent exemplify, we also have the strength of the City of London and our financial sector, uh, worth about 12% of our GDP, and we have three of the world's top 10 universities and a higher education sector, which is globally ranked second. So you put those things together, and you've got the financing, you've got the academic research, and you've got the entrepreneurs, and you've got an incredible opportunity for us as a country. And you are one of the five key industries that we want to make sure succeed. We believe it's incredibly important for you regulation for all our companies so that we are a real enterprise economy. The second one is employment, because most businesses talk about labour shortages, but we have 6.6 .6 million people of working age who are not in work, and we need to harness their skills and talents so that we can become a high wage, high skill economy. Uh, the third need is everywhere, because we want the benefits of what we do to um, spread right away across the UK. And the fourth E is education. Uh, and that is absolutely essential because that is the, the human materials that you need for your companies uh, in order to employ the engineers, the coders, the innovators who are going to make you successful internationally. So the government has a very clear agenda that we're working on. But we also know that when it comes to green industry and clean energy, there are some very specific concerns that we want us to help you address, uh, including uh, our response to the Inflation Reduction Act and the £368 billion pounds of subsidies that America is giving on the table, what we do to unlock pension fund investment, what we do to address future scale-ups, lots of people talk about access to the national grid being an issue, how we can make sure that our regulatory environment is, is well beating uh, we take advantage of the minimal amount of flexibility that we now have over a very different environment. So, all those things we want to hear about. A lot of those things are to do with the supply side, what you're thinking of doing, uh, the inputs you're able to access. But of course, the demand side is also very important. What consumers, what governments decide they want to do, how they want to buy their energy, where they want to spend. Pounds. And so, an equally important part of our plan is for the first time I announced it here today, we were going to have a national energy efficiency program and ambition to reduce our national energy 
the consumption by 15% over the next five years. And I'm delighted to announce today that we have now a chair of our energy efficiency task force, who is Daniel Harrison Rose, speaking of that rest. Um, so um, before I talk to my fellow Secretary of State, uh, could you give a round of applause to Daniel Rose? <laughs> Pleasure to be here today, and I've been delighted to um, that I've been asked to co-chair the new Energy Efficiency Task Force alongside Lord Callanan. Um, put simply, and I think that the Chancellor made those comments, but put, put simply, tackling the climate emergency is one of, if not the biggest issue of our time. But tackling the climate challenge cannot be done alone. It is absolutely a team sport. Building vital partnerships between the public and private sectors is going to be key to unlocking this challenge at pace and at scale. And I think it is incumbent on all of us to bridge the interlinkages between sectors to support decarbonisation across the whole economy and greater energy efficiency is essential if we're to meet the UK's ambition as we've outlined here. Whilst greater energy efficiency does, of course, go hand in hand with the need to tackle the climate emergency and deliver on net zero, something which is absolutely critical, I'm very clear that this is not just a climate or green issue. The war in Ukraine has brought into sharp focus that greater energy efficiency is essential if we're to address in the long term, long term and sustainable, the cost of living challenges that households and businesses across the country are facing, as well as enhancing the long-term energy security of the UK. But also, more importantly, this should be seen as a significant economic opportunity for the UK. More energy efficient buildings reduce climate impact through lower emissions, greater economic security for households and businesses, through lower bills, greater energy security through our country, through reduced energy demand. And that, in a nutshell, is the collective ambition that I hope we can work with and towards through the task force. The task force is going to bring together experts and leaders from across government, industry, academia, and the charitable sector to identify the challenges and how we break down the barriers. But setting out the ambition is one thing, getting there is the real challenge that we will face. And I've seen firsthand through my work uh, at NatWest Group with partners in um, groups such as the Sustainable Homes and Buildings Coalition, of which the bank is a founding member of what we can actually achieve. The work of the coalition has shown, frankly, if you are a householder who wants to make your home more energy efficient, right now it's too difficult. It's too difficult to work out what steps you need to take to retrofit your home, find and access the funding you need to pay for it, and critically then find the trusted, skilled tradespeople to deliver the improvements that you want. But the potential benefits are significant. Warmer homes and cost savings for households, greater energy security for the UK. And for the UK businesses, and in particular here, I'm thinking about our SMEs, they also face challenges when it comes to retrofitting their premises. Our springboard to sustainable recovery research has shown that being more energy efficient can not only reduce the operating costs of SMEs, but it also has the potential to make them more productive and more competitive. With high energy prices, the business case for making the investments in these improvements is stronger than ever. Our report found that if UK SMEs were supported to insulate their premises effectively, they could see savings of over £500 million per year in avoided gas prices, assuming prices remain elevated. But beyond these savings, the broader transition to net zero also presents SMEs with a huge economic opportunity. The transition can offer them a potential of £175 billion plus revenue opportunity. It could create 40,000 new businesses and 260,000 new jobs. So there is an enormous business opportunity that we can offer here. So whether it's through insulating buildings, installing heat pumps, installing rooftop solar, the UK SMEs and businesses more generally have a critical role to play in delivering on our energy efficiency ambitions. 
And businesses, along with households, have to be at the forefront of our thinking when we address this. So this is a multifaceted, cross-sector challenge with the potential for economy and society-wide benefits. And there are a few areas where I think the task force can really focus to shift the dial in a meaningful way. Firstly, we need to increase consumer, public sector and business engagement in the delivery of existing and new initiatives on energy efficiency and clean heat. That means making it as easy and affordable as possible to retrofit our buildings and ensuring that the wider cost-saving benefit of doing so is understood by the public. That in turn means we need to increase the availability of green finance that is linked to robust installation standards, ensuring the safety and quality of materials and working practices is key to this. We also critically need to break down the barriers that exist in the current market and regulatory frameworks when it comes to reducing demand for energy making sure that the policy is designed and implemented in a way that works for consumers, businesses, and society, and at pace. And of course, stimulating demand for energy efficiency improvements is one side of the equation. But we also have to stimulate the supply side, reduce skill gaps, accelerate pathways to accreditation for tradespeople, improve the products on offer, and increase availability of the materials required to deliver high quality upgrades at pace. So quite a lot of work to do. But I hope today that this gives you a flavor of the issues that the Energy Efficiency Task Force will seek to tackle. I very much look forward to working with my co-chair on the challenge, but also the very significant business opportunity that this presents. Thank you very much. We're, we're going to move on to a Q&A, um, and I'm just going to kick it off with my two fellow Secretaries of State, um, and just to ask them to get the ball rolling. Maybe I could start with you, Grant. What do you think the big challenges are uh, facing our green industries? Uh, we talked about IRA and people's worries about that. Mm. Thoughts on that, and also maybe where nuclear fits into all of this? Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, I, I, I'd actually talk about our big advantages, uh, and then sort of pivot that to what we should be worried about. Now, IRA is one of those things, potentially. In terms of advantages, uh, of course, we're sat here a mile away from the city of London, uh, which already has attracted more green finance than anywhere else in the world. And the city of London is one of two major uh, financial uh, capitals. We've got, uh, in terms of our advantages, the extraordinary educational advantages. I think you said three out of 10. I was looking at the latest data. I think it might even be four out of 10 ranked top universities in this last uh, year. Uh, we've got the North Sea, which has been responsible for so much of our oil and gas, and in a remarkable turn of good luck that you couldn't have possibly imagined when we first started uh, excavating oil and gas, uh, we now have an opportunity to refill those holes uh, with carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Uh, and it could be the capacity for an enormous amount of what the world needs and certainly Europe needs to um, store. And we've had the foresight to get into this a decade before most of the rest of the world woke up. You described yourself how we became the first in the world to legislate for net zero. Uh, we also were the first, and you and I will remember, from being in cabinet 10 years ago under David Cameron when we made those really quite risky at the time uh, decisions. I can remember. David Cameron saying, what are we doing with these strike prices on contracts for difference for these uh, wind turbines? They're going to cost more than nuclear over their li lifetime. And now we see uh, the contract for differences uh, for offshore wind having come right down. So what we've got is a market advantage because we got there first. Uh, and what we've got are the different pieces of the puzzle, which means that you know our next contracts for differences for wind farms offshore will see wind turbines, which are uh, the scale and size of the turbine covering seven football pitches as a single turbine turns. Seven football pitches in scope. These things are enormous. And then building 300 of them next to each other. So we've got scale. The threats to this, though, uh, are, as you say, uh, actually, I think, in some ways, quite good threats. The rest of the world has fundamentally woken up to the need to get this job done. So we're now in a competitive race. But 10 or 12 years ago, when we were discussing those 
contracts for difference. We weren't. No one else was doing them. That's why it was so expensive at the time. But because we've got that technological lead in things like wind power, in hydrogen, in carbon capture, utilization and storage, we now need to capitalize on those things. Uh, there are lots of different ways to combat um, IRA. Uh, some, of course, I'm sure will fall with the Treasury. The ones that I'll be focusing on, the ones which give us the competitive advantage to uh, uh, use uh, the, the kind of being ahead of this game uh, kind of initiatives that we've already taken. Excellent. Let me just ask a quick opener to Therese. Um, just tell us about the environmental improvement plan and how it affects these guys and how they can help you to make it work, but also how it can help them. So five years ago, we had the 25-year environment plan and the environmental improvement plan is in effect a, a refresh after five years, whereas we had the vision before, this is very much driven by the delivery. And also a number of the powers that we were able to gain through taking the Environment Act through Parliament. So where I see in particular, I can see green growth as a number of different aspects of innovation uh, that could be coming. Uh, we cover all sorts. It's not all just about biodiversity. But of course, we should be reminded of uh, Professor Dasgupta's re review about how investment in biodiversity actually generates a lot of jobs uh, and that we need to treat it uh, not as being a nice add-on. In terms of uh, ways that I can see uh, organizations like this. We've been doing a lot on packaging. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of financing of climate adaptation. So insurance industries need to be thinking ahead anyway about the opportunity costs by not preparing or at least trying to mitigate some of that. Uh, but it could be a variety of things. We've got, uh, I was in the States last week, uh, we went and did a lot of ag tech. We're about to bring into law the gene editing bill, uh, have, make that an act of parliament. And that will unleash a lot of innovation and opportunity to plan ahead but also be a massive export opportunity as well. So it's a balancing act here. I could go on on different things about our resources and waste strategy. The circular economy is probably the key thing where I can see a lot of innovation. If we think about the precious resources that we have around the world, we need to get back those old mobile phones, that's just a classic example, and get extract that material and really just make that a part of way of how we do business. And that's why aspects of our regulation drive us that way as well. So not only is it about being careful with resources, it's about being careful with money too, uh, instead of just thinking we can always spend our way um, of different ways. So different policies in the past, all coming into fruition, uh, which will help our natural environment uh, recover. Excellent. Right, well, I've got, while you're thinking of your questions, I've got three uh, that have been pre-notified to me. So I'll take these three first and then uh, have a thought if you'd like to dive in with a question. But first of all, I've got Tom Sampson from Rolls-Royce. Tom. Hi, thank you, Chancellor, and uh, thank you to the government for showcasing the potential of our green industries in the UK. Uh, with UK green industries, we now have a new dimension of energy diplomacy as we look to export a number of green technologies globally. Uh, Rolls-Royce small nuclear reactors are factory built into a power plant. We've seen a huge demand increase over the last 12 months in places like Central Europe and other parts of the world where the focus of nuclear power is a way to strengthen Well, let me pass that one over to uh, the Energy Security Secretary. <laughs> the Energy Security <laughs> Secretary, whose budget it will come from. <laughs> um, thanks to your large yes, Chancellor. Uh, I, th I think your question is really interesting because if there's one thing we've learned in the last year, and we should have known many years before, it doesn't matter which form of energy you want to produce, there are always dangers. So, you know, uh, Putin invading Ukraine uh, caused major problems to hydrocarbons. Um, France has discovered over the last summer uh, that their nuclear uh, fleet uh, needed a lot of repair, some scheduled, some unscheduled at the same time. So a country heavily reliant on only, well, not only, but largely nuclear, found itself importing from our renewables about a half a gig uh, over the last year. Um, my point is actually that I think the best and most secure energy mix is to have a real combination of different types of energy sources. Renewables, yes, big, very important uh, elements. And uh, as you, you said, Jeremy, we're, we're seeing increasing, we've just seen yet a new record set for 21 gigawatts of uh, energy produced from uh, uh, wind power, for example. I was at the National Grid yesterday talking to them there. They, describing how 10 years ago it just wasn't a factor. There was no wind coming in or very few megawatts. Now it's gigawatts coming in, massive load balances. But we need the base load 
of nuclear. And I'm hugely enthusiastic and backing around a quarter of our energy can come from a nuclear room. We've just funded uh, to, to kickstart the uh, Sizewell C. We've got Hinkley Point C. We're back in the business of, of, of investing. But small modular reactors, of particular interest to you, are of key interest to us as well. I think there's a global market of both uh, sovereign wealth funds, for example, investing in the UK and our unique experience in SMRs. Rolls Royce have run them around in submarines for six decades, but also are being able to sell them uh, to the rest of the world uh, as well in that expertise. So it's a very important part of the mix. But what we must never do is end up putting all our eggs in one energy basket. I think that will always be a mistake. Thank you. Now, from the Impact Investment Institute, we've got Bella Landy now. Bella? Hi, thank you. Yeah, I can't project like uh, my, my colleague. Um, thank you very much for hosting us, Chancellor. Uh, green industry is really, really important to um, uh, the levelling up agenda. Um, and in terms of job, job creation, uh, access to uh, affordable infrastructure. Um, can you explain uh, how, what you see the role of local authorities is in identifying those investment opportunities in their area and attracting finance? And what is central government going to do or is doing to support local authorities in that, um, be it sort of uh, risk mitigation uh, mechanisms and such like? Um, I'll have a crack at that, but maybe I'll... I'll pass to uh, my colleagues as well. I mean, in terms of the central thrust of government policy at the moment, it is to shift power down to local authorities. We think we're too centralized, um, and we think the, the leveling up agenda, in the end, will only succeed if we are empowering local areas to solve their own problems. And of course, the net zero agenda is one of those very, very pressing problems that we want everyone to engage with. But, uh, Trace, do you want to come in on that one? Sure. Well, just quite a lot of what we do at DEFRA is um, often national, if not international, frameworks, and then a lot of it requires local delivery. So recycling is a great example of that, where we want our councils to strive however they can to improve uh, that. If we think about the amount of food waste that ends up in landfill, you know, responsible for millions of tonnes of carbon every year. So we have to work with them very much so uh, but every now and again, I'm afraid some of them need quite a bit of a shove as well. Um, and that's why we'll help them with aspects of, uh, of financing to help them uh, be at the cutting edge rather than uh, perhaps uh, be at the back of the pack. So plenty to encourage uh, local government to be um, innovative, I believe, in that score. So it happens tomorrow. I'm uh, seeing Andy Street up in the West Midlands. We're looking at more stuff that we can do on air quality rather than always just thinking about having levies all over the place let's be innovative in the local delivery of uh, making sure that we can keep business moving we can keep traffic moving we can keep people getting to work uh, and uh, improve air quality at the same time too Grant? I, the only thing i was going to add it's less a local authority point but just a generalization but a happy circumstance a lot of the uh, green jobs happen to be in the different regions of the country so i mean if you look at teesside for example a hydrogen uh, hub uh, you've got the Humber, that will be a you know, great jumping off point for, and is for, uh, you know, I know when I went to Ingham, Immingham uh, and, uh, and, and skipping a boat out to the 12 miles out to the, to the wind farm. You've got in, in uh, Northern Ireland, you've got people like Wright buses um, doing hydrogen buses. So actually, a, a lot of the really good high tech green jobs happen to be based much more around the regions in this country than they are necessarily in, uh, in, the, in the, you know, the financial South and, and, and London. So, uh, so this happens to be a very good combination of leveling up. Excellent. Um, now we're gonna have plenty of time for questions, so uh, have a final thought. Just before, I've got one last one, Nicola Waters from Electron. Nicola. Hi, for those of you that don't know, Electron is a uh, flexibility marketplace software. So think energy and grid capacity used at the right time, the right place for the right price. So we deal with people developing assets, people that um, have assets in operation today, and also the people that run the networks. And my question is, so obviously you talked earlier about the grid constraints that people can't connect. So it would be really great to understand some of the initiatives that you're launching there, but also how you are going to enable non-wire alternatives such as flexibility marketplaces to play a role in that um, capacity utilization. Thank you. 
Grant. Yeah, I, look, I think this is one of the biggest problems, uh, biggest issues that the new Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, Zero needs to fix. Um, the, the reality is, in this massive shift to electricity uh, over other forms of power, uh, we need to do, I think, with the grid uh, in the space of very few years, uh, seven times as much investment that's taken place over the last 30 years. And the frustration of, for example, having enormous warehouses capable of housing fantastic array of solar cells, but then if they did, not being able to get them into the grid is a problem that we are on to uh, fixing. We have a network commissioner set up producing a report for me, I'm going to see in the next couple of months, uh, on all the different aspects of that. I can tell you some early insights. I mean, planning rules which you know, maximize the amount that you can do without planning permission to 50 megawatts is an obvious one. But so is the fact that it takes sometimes years to organize a connection uh, into the grid. Now, part of that can be dealt with by not having to send everything into the grid, frankly. If we were inventing our electricity network today, we probably wouldn't create a uh, nationwide grid in quite the same way as we, uh, as we, as we have done in the, in the past. Um, so there'll be lots of different options. I'm very excited about uh, looking at all the different uh, options and, and technologies to do that. But we're also looking at things like the planning laws, and we'll be coming forward with a, uh, a suite, suite of changes uh, to uh, improve the connectivity and the speed. I mean, classically, even though we have the world's largest wind farm, and the second largest, and the third largest, and the fourth largest right now, uh, it still takes too long to plan for them and build them, and we want to massively reduce, perhaps even halving the time uh, it takes to, to get from permission to from a project to permission to build these things. So um, a huge amount going on in this area. I look forward to further conversations with you. And I know uh, Minister Graham Stewart's right here in the front, and I know that you've already been involved in conversations with uh, Graham, who looks after this energy net zero area as well. Excellent. Right, let's take some questions. There's a gentleman here at the front. Yes. We'll just allow a mic to get to you. So my name is Guy Strafford. I'm the chairman of Carbon Quota. Um, we're, we do a lot of um, carbon emission tracking for some world-class companies like Procter & Gamble. And the big thing I'd like to say is thank Kate, because we're based in Plexel, so we've been a beneficiary of this great startup place and it's been a fabulous incubator. And thank you, Chancellor, because an Innovate UK grant was critical in us building our business. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, my quick question was, uh, the North Sea has potential, apparently, to produce 250 gig gigawatts of electricity. How can the UK take advantage of that to potentially for our industrial base? And what could we take more advantage of that in the future? Grant? Well, look, I have a very simple objective coming into this job, and it, we've been stung by the high costs of energy. It's hit our economy very hard. It's a drag an anchor on, on growth. Uh, if you look at the most successful economies in the world, Britain, during the Industrial Revolution, when we produced endless amounts of cheap coal, uh, America now, uh, with a different mix to the one that we'll be pursuing, but nonetheless very cheap energy, uh, they get the economic advantage, both for households and for uh, business. So I want to see us have the cheapest energy uh, by 2035, by which I mean electricity, and by which I mean the wholesale price. Uh, we need to do a whole bunch of things to get there, including disconnecting the gas wholesale price from the renewable price. It's a ludicrous situation that we've ended up with uh, through a chance of of history uh, that we're paying uh, too much because of these uh, connections that are in place. Uh, but you're right, there's a massive amount of opportunity. I mentioned about uh, you know, these enormous wind farms that, we're, that we have um, in terms of total wind energy, second only to China, of course vast by comparison, uh, but we have the bigger wind farms than themselves uh, and the new capacity that's gonna come in. But wind is only part of it. And we have plans on the carbon capture utilization and storage to reuse all the space that we've, we've dug uh, hydrocarbons um, out of. And a fantastic opportunity, if we get all of these different elements right, including hydrogen, to be exporting hydrogen and energy to the world as well. Um, energy independence is a fundamentally very popular uh, idea. Extraordinarily, we've actually managed, thanks to the Treasury, to end up paying up to a half of household electricity bills, a third of, of businesses' uh, bills. Almost no one knows we're doing it. Most people wouldn't believe we're doing it because the price is still high. That is the thing that we need to fix. Cheap, reliable, renewable energy, plentiful, driving the economy and making the cost of living much more affordable. 
Thank you. Right, let's uh, see. There's a lady there. I can see with, I think, a blue top. Yes. Thank you very much. Cheryl Harles, Director of Energy Capital from the West Midlands Combined Authority. Um, you just mentioned um, that cheaper electricity could come from local um, sources, essentially. How can we make that happen, given the challenges that we're facing at the moment? I guess it's served you, Grant, but I can, <laughs> I can uh, um, have a crack as well. Grid or yeah, I mean, look, I think there are lots of ways of looking at this. But one thing, actually, I mean, the war has been terrible. It's displaced millions of people uh, and caused uh, huge harm to economies and livelihoods. Uh, the one thing it has done is pushed up the cost of energy. Uh, the lots of alternative renewable forms of energy suddenly look cheap by comparison. So 12 years ago, when I put solar panels on my own house, it felt like a very marginal decision that might never pay for itself and was expensive to do. Uh, now, looking back, it was a very smart thing to do, but I could never have known what was going to happen with energy prices in between time. Uh, right now, uh, it makes sense to invest in uh, re renewables and, you know, the West Midlands that are at scale uh, with ambitious plans from the mayor that, that we're all talking to, to, to him about. Um, these things stack up in a way that they didn't before. The stuff that's getting in your way from doing it, though, are the interconnections. And they're getting it into the, the grid, which is why this conversation about where you don't need to even put it into the grid, plus what we do to sort out getting it into the grid, I think are all really, uh, really, really critical. But, but um, you know, I'm looking forward to sort of taking those conversations uh, forward with Andrew Street and others. I mean, there is a very simple thing I would just add to that, which is that nearly every significant adaptation of a building to make it uh, more carbon neutral requires planning permission. And that is something where I'm sure Dame Allison will be looking at uh, what we could do to make that easier, because at the moment, those processes uh, can be very, very depressingly long-winded, and uh, that's not the kind of incentive that we need. Now, let's take a, another question. Gentleman here, uh, just near the camera. Hello, Nick Muller, Executive Director of the Aldersgate Group. Um, last month, the uh, Chris Skidmore published uh, the Net Zero Review with uh, 25 really well thought through recommendations around what could be done to uh, ensure the UK st sticks on its course towards its net zero target, but also how we can really maximize competitive advantages for the UK economy. So there was a range of recommendations around green finance, buildings, transport, heavy industry, and so on. Could you? Give us a sense of how the government plans to respond to the Skinmore review. And are there particular areas that you would like to prioritize in your response? Thank you. Thank you. Chris is here. Where is Chris? Is he... He's co-chairing one of the um, roundtables oh, okay. well, on we'll regulation. Chris, Chris will be uh, yeah. around later. Um, and he's done an absolutely excellent report. It's a challenging report for the government uh, because he's you know, holding our feet to the fire about our, our net zero commitments. And he talks about a lot of very important things that we want to do. We, we, agree with the thrust of what he said. Um, we intend to respond to it uh, fulsomely um, because we, you know, we asked him to do the report in the first place. Um, and uh, when we respond, we'll also be responding to the sort of things that you're raising with us uh, this afternoon. And uh, just to reassure you, we're not thinking of this as a, a long process. We want to respond in the late spring, early summer so that everyone knows exactly what it is that we're planning to do on a range of the issues that we've talked about today. Uh, let's do another question. Lady here, just uh, other side of the aisle from the camera. Hi, I'm just two questions, actually. I wanted to know what our response will be to the US's IRA. Um, and especially when we think about the fact that only 18.5% of investment in green energy actually comes to fruition because of issues related to planning, regulation, et cetera. How do we encourage that investment? The second point I wanted to ask you about was you talked about 6 million people of working age not currently in employment. Is this government going to look at the apprenticeship levy and ensure that it is easier to train apprentices and that we don't have to hand back quite as much of it? Um, well, I guess that's for me. Um, and uh, the answer is that uh, we always looking at how the apprenticeship levy is working. Uh, we often hear those complaints from businesses, so we, we listen to those. 
But I think our judgment inside government is that the apprenticeship program has been a huge success and it has created an avenue into training and skills that didn't exist before in a way that is extremely popular with the people who go on those it courses. It could do more though, um, that's the point. Yeah, it's not we, that it hasn't been a success, but you could do a lot more. Well, we, we always listen to those representations, um, but um, so we hear what you say, but we, we think that there is something very worthwhile that is happening in the apprenticeship program. Um, and in terms of our response, I'll, I'll ask Grant for a comment. I, look, w it goes without saying after the difficult autumn statement that I had to deliver uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, that this is not a time when it's going to be easy for us to access the GDP equivalent of $369 billion that President Biden found. I would say that we have to remember in that equation that the U.S. is somewhat coming from behind because uh, the previous president was not remotely interested in net zero, as we all know. Um, so there is some catch-up element in what the U.S. is doing, but it is a very real competitive threat. Uh, that we have to be alive to. And I think uh, from the Treasury's point of view, what we want to look at is the five trillion pounds of pension fund assets, uh, which are currently rarely invested. I think less than 1% of them are invested in unlisted companies. Um, and um, that's something that I'm sure we'll, we'll have discussions with the governor of the bank about in due course. But we do think... Uh, there is an opportunity there. We do ask ourselves whether those pension funds are doing the best job for the pensioners who they represent, present and future, uh, in terms of getting returns when they invest so little in the industries that are likely to be generating the highest returns in the future. I'll just comment on the uh, IRA uh, thing. I, I was talking to John Kerry about this, and he put it like this in this kind of interesting argument. In America, uh, what they don't have is the political consensus and therefore the regulatory regime to deliver what we've been doing for over a decade and i described how contract for differences came about and that's because uh, they don't have a bipartisan approach to this there are massive divisions between democrats and republicans in our parliament the only real uh, debate is how fast we can go and when and there's a bidding war essentially to to, to get there both sides you know wanted to legislate for net zero. I don't think he even went to a vote, actually, if I remember correctly. Um, so we have the regulatory certainty that all businesses crave. They've had to make up for it by essentially creating a subsidy regime, which worked through their political problems in order to deliver cash. As Jeremy says, they're coming from a decade behind. And I've spent the last three and a half years building something called the, the Jet Zero Council, which in aviation terms, is looking at how we solve the problem of you know, zero carbon flight or guilt-free flying, because otherwise we won't be able to carry on flying around the world. So sustainable aviation fuel, of which our policy is way ahead of the states, 10% SAF required by the end of the decade, uh, double that of Europe, by the way. It's how we get the hydrogen aircraft to power engines in the future. We have an American company here called Zero Avia, who uh, one of our catapults is invested in and are doing all of their R&D in the United Kingdom, um, and so on and so forth. And the American airlines have been desperate to join our Jet Zero Council, a combination of industry, government, and uh, 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 academia, uh, to build the right platforms to, 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 to deliver on this. And we're now three or four years down the, the, the line on it. So um, it is important that we're alive to what they've done. Uh, some of which will probably be a uh, breach of WTO uh, rules. Uh, we do know that we, uh, the Americans have actually already moved to take off some of the rougher edges, and we look for them to do more. But we also know that we already have a massive gain, a uh, massive lead in this. And, and so we mustn't sort of talk ourselves uh, into imagining that they can make up for 10 years of not going anywhere on this uh, whilst we've been steaming ahead. We, we can still pick up on those benefits and deliver them. Right, uh, gentlemen here. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Andrew Woods, Chief Executive of Catagen. Catagen's a Belfast-based net zero technology company working on new, new ways to make green hydrogen and e-fuels. 
Um, we're a scale-up company, and I guess, really, we've talked a lot about energy security and energy sovereignty. What are the government's thoughts about net zero technology sovereignty? Because typically what happens, really exciting businesses, whenever they get to a certain scale, they could be harvested by other jurisdictions and end up headquartered in other regions. And I think we're a fantastic nation of innovators. Um, but what can the government do or what are the government's thoughts around helping scale up companies with exciting technology bridge the gap in manufacturing readiness level and commercial readiness level before we get to, to scale and market let, success? Let me have a crack on that and then maybe Grant might want to come in. But um, the first thing I would say is that it's important to recognize how far we've come. So 10 years ago, when I was culture secretary responsible for our technology industry, uh, there was a lot of concern about the availability of funding for startups. Now, the sub 5 million funding, most people say, if you've got a good idea, you should be able to find funding. It's become massively easier than it ever was. And the discussion has moved on to scale up funding, which is still much harder than it is in the United States. It's probably easier here than it is in anywhere else in Europe, but it's still harder than the United States with whom we compete. And so we have had um, a number of issues with either uh, people moving to the United States or being acquired by US companies. And we are actively, I would say that's probably in our top three problems that we are looking to solve when it comes to our becoming the world's next Silicon Valley project, the issue of scale up capital. So it's a, it's a very key issue. Um, in terms of um, what you describe as energy security sovereignty, um, which, which slightly relates to the last question uh, about IRA, I think that um, we are now thinking about energy security sovereignty. It's not a phrase I think I've used before, uh, following what happened in Ukraine in a much more realistic way. And um, I think what we've concluded is just as you know, we have learned that it was dangerous to be energy dependent on Russia. We need to make sure that we're not technology dependent on any other country, but China is the obvious one that springs to mind when we're not quite sure which direction somewhere like China is willing to go. Now, what I would argue very strongly is that that is not a reason to go back to protectionism and that we as Western democracies will lose out very big time if we start saying that we have to onshore every single technology uh, because we can benefit enormously from uh, trade between countries whose values we share. But we do have to be realistic that we are moving into a world where people do use technological dependency for diplomatic leverage. And unfortunately, we've just got to smell the coffee on that. I don't know if you want the, to add. The only thing I was going to add is we have the mechanisms in place to do exactly what Jeremy was saying. We have the National Security Investment Act for the past few months. I've been responsible for looking at every deal which might contravene certain parameters uh, under that act, which has been in place for a year now. Uh, if there's something significant, for example, there was a Newport Wafer Fab where I took a decision to remove Chinese ownership from something I thought was a potential national security issue. Uh, but many other deals would go through, and I think we do need to be that kind of open economy, wise to the things which are genuine security uh, issues, but in the, at the same time, we want to attract inward investment. And I just gave, in the previous answer, a very good example of a carbon tech, uh, a, a jet zero tech, uh, where an American company has been uh, induced to come here and do its development here and hire hundreds of people here. Uh, so, you know, this is a two-way race as well. Now we've got eight minutes for the final questions. Let's just see how many questions. I think what I'm going to do is take two groups of three questions. Um, so I can see three hands over here, um, lady in the green, and then gentleman on the other side of you. Can I take those three together, and then uh, we'll uh, take another three and see where we get to. Liv Garfield, Seven Trends, and also chair of the West Business Business Council. Um, two, th two thoughts. So I think you're going to hear consistently all day that there are three problems in terms of real scale renewable energy investment. It is planning. It is connection back into the grid. But I think it's also the kind of sense of it coming together slightly better in terms of long-term policy and having a sense of that from government. So I think it's great that you're alive to the first two. 
I think having that conversation about the third is probably true as well, right? Uh, that's number one. And number two is, I really hope in the response to the Skidmore review that we get into process emissions, because the only way to really create, I think, technical advantage for ourselves, but a long-term upside for us as a nation, is to really innovate around that process emissions point. I think there are lots of people in the room that have ideas, that'll have startups, that'll have scale companies doing stuff. We could really make that quite special for ourselves as a nation. I'd love to see that in the government response. Thank you. Do you want to pass it to the gentleman on your right? Thanks. Ian O'Donnell from the Federation of Small Businesses. Um, we've talked a lot about energy provision, but one of the best ways to reduce our energy demand is to reduce our need for energy. Looking at particularly housing stock and small business stock, obviously with my view there, how do we encourage and incentivise the real challenges around some of our older housing stock and business premises to make them lower energy consumers, in particular looking at things like planning, rate system to reduce the fact that often this results in an increase, and just accessing those opportunities, which at the moment are the biggest challenge for many urban areas in reducing their carbon emissions. Thank you. And there's another gentleman just uh, behind you. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Andrew Elms from Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. We manufacture enormous wind turbines, the likes that you mentioned, uh, 108 meter blades made up in hull. The next year will be powering your house with one turn of a rotor. Um, but this is an industry in real trouble. Uh, we risk skipping, delaying our targets to uh, 20, 30, 50 gigawatts. We're at a kind of perfect storm of inflation costs, logistic costs, technology de development costs hitting the supply chain, and then the electricity generator levy and the strike prices hitting the developers. And we really risk this six gigawatts, seven gigawatts of CFD4 being delayed or slipped, CFD5 being a non-event and a damp squib. I think the industry is desperate to hear that that message has got through and that hopefully there is some sucker coming to us in your spring budget or in some sort of form of mechanism that means that we don't lose the advantage we have as an offshore leader uh, and that we don't miss our targets for 2030. Thank you. Trace, do you want to comment on... Well, I just thought it might be worth talking about resource efficiency and productivity. You talk about energy efficiency. If I think about water, I mean, Liv wasn't asking about water, but uh, chief executive water company. There's a lot of stress there uh, in different parts of the country. And that's why innovation, for example, uh, having washing machines, very simple, but can actually use a lot less water and a lot less electricity. If I think about the amount of electricity and actually the poverty premium when it comes to energy costs is in things like old things, like old fridges and different elements like that. So if we were to do more to try and help with getting to the latest A+, plus, not only would that help with food waste, it would help with um, uh, kind of reducing energy bills in people's households, but also some of the carbon leakage that comes with the very old coolants in that way. So I think you are seeing that longer term thinking that is coming through and uniting um, uh, departments across government to try and make sure uh, that we have pathways along the way that bring in multiple resources. So we're, let's try and get some more timber housing rather than the energy intensive bricks would be one example. Uh, they do it in Scotland. We should be able to do it in this country as well. Right. Just on the housing point, actually, uh, because <laughs> Jeremy and I were in Parliament in opposition when we were dreaming up things like what was called the Green Deal, which was not an altogether successful policy in itself. And uh, it turned out to be one of a long list of different approaches to trying to green up our stock. But we're also sort of used to saying and repeating the mantra that none of this wor is working, that we've kind of missed the point that actually overall, uh, we have now gone from, I think it was only 11% of all our homes meeting the energy performance certificate rating ABC uh, back in 2010, now to 46%, so 47 actually, I think is the latest figure I saw. We're getting on to the point where half of our stock has, which is very old Victorian stock in, in many cases, has now been um, greened up. So I think we're probably at a point where we are able to shift to the other side of this and say to people, um, right, you're now in the minority very soon of stock which hasn't been uh, greened up and sort of watch this space because through all of these different initiatives we're taking, including a new one called Eco Plus, we're about to make a big step change to this uh, to, to this again. I'll just comment on the, on, on the wind farm. I know through the fourth auction there are some concerns. I know that these are concerns in the fifth. Um, and we hear what you're saying. We, we understand this is painful all, 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 all round. That's what inflation does. It's one of the reasons why the Chancellor rightly says it harms us number all. One. It hurts us all. Number one. It is number one, brilliant. Yes. And it hurts us all. Um, uh, so, of course, we'll, 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 we'll look to be working with the uh, industry on a way uh, to, to help 
you know, all round get through this. I'm absolutely confident that's that's possible. And uh, uh, to answer your question, yes, we've heard the problem. And to answer Liv's point very directly, the reason for the conference today is because we do want to publish a uh, cross-government strategy for our green industries. It's a very, very important part of our economic strategy as a whole. So you will see that later on this year. I think I've probably got time for three brief ones. I'm going to go right to this side. I can see a lady, a gentleman, and a lady behind. Uh, if you want to, if you could just make it fairly brief, that would be much appreciated. Um, Inasa Mohammed, I'm a CEO of h 2 Power. Uh, we're a technology hydrogen business, nine years old, and uh, originally spun out of Cambridge University. Uh, nine years ago was the worst time to start a hydrogen business, and we only exist today because of the government support. So firstly, thank you for that. Uh, secondly, today we are a scale-up, well-positioned to deploy our technology worldwide. We have demand in the U.S., in the rest of Europe, and we're, we're quite happy to be in that position because of, of the, the past support. My question is about the title of the event today, which is Connect Green Industries. Net Zero Technologies today have a problem of immediate demand. And if industries were to, call up, to, to collaborate with each other, the de demand will be created and the cost of the technologies will drop down. So uh, that connection is very, very valuable. My question to you is how will you make that connection? How will you connect green industries to the point where demand is created and innovators can actually grow faster to meet net zero targets? OK, thank you. Thank you. Gentleman next to you, I think. Hello, Julian David from uh, Tech UK Digital uh, Trade Association, Digital Tech Trade Association. I just wanted to make an offer and then a concern. The offer is that uh, our industry, which you highlighted, Chancellor, uh, is able to reduce, those studies show we can reduce um, uh, carbon emissions by 15 to 20 percent. And I would like to offer that we get involved, particularly in demand management, as you mentioned, Secretary of State. The concern is other parts of government, which don't always seem to chime in, we're particularly bothered in our industry about the foreign influence register, which seems to have exactly the opposite impact in terms of encouraging uh, countries, as you say, like-minded countries and their, their uh, industries to come and invest here. So I wonder if you could take a look at that. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there was a lady, I think a couple of rows behind. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Louise Smith. I'm from the Aura Innovation Centre. Uh, part of the University of Hull, so another Hull. Um, my question is really, we've uh, benefited hugely from offshore wind, um, investing in a small university. How can we ensure that we can continue to do and helping you grow the economy in a region where, which can't frankly even agree on a devolution deal? Um, how can we make it easier? We're doing a lot of good work with SMEs in the lower tiers, all the focus is on the higher tier. So how can we ensure that we can continue to help you grow the economy in the region, being a smaller university? Thank you. Um, I'll take away the um, comment about the Foreign Influence Act. You should talk to Dame Alison Rose about how you can help on energy efficiency. I know she'd be all ears. Um, and I just, I, I'll make one comment and then I'll pass to my colleagues to make a final comment. Um, it's very, very important for the government that the opportunities uh, from our growth industries, our innovation industries, are spread throughout the country. Uh, we, have, we already have a London, Oxford, Cambridge hub, um, but it's very hard to expand because of the cost of property, lab space, and um, we have enormous numbers of highly talented people across the whole of the UK, and we need to tap into uh, our university network across the UK in particular. Um, and that's why one of the policies that we announced, I announced in the autumn statement, is our investment zone policy, where the, the 10 investment zones that we announced will all be centered on a university because we want them to be, become clusters for high growth industries. Um, let me pass on to, to Grant and then to Rose. I actually haven't got anything specific to add, so for the purpose of speed. Well, I was just going to suggest that the continuous investment in skills and drawing people using the free port Use all the levers that you have, because uh, frankly, trying to pull in business rates is very attractive. Uh, if you have 100% of nothing, you're not going anywhere. Encourage your local authorities to use the discount opportunities they can have, because uh, that pie is there to be shared around and make full use of all the levelling up funding that is coming. So, you know, there, there are opportunities to get outside of the M25 without question. And as uh, Grant said early on, a lot of the growth industries really are happening 
uh, way beyond the M25. Thank you. We're just going to go now into our breakout sessions. Um, there'll be ministers, people from the government in all of the breakout sessions, so I encourage you to be very open um, in what you say. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, we've got the governor of the Bank of England here. It's relevant in one more way. Um, back in 1986, the city of London was first amongst equals as a financial centre in Europe, but it wasn't dominant. Then we had Big Bang, and now London and New York are the world's two great financial centres. That, that is the model that we want for our green industries. We are, you know, nose ahead at the moment, but we're not globally dominant. What would it take to use the advantages we have now to turn us into a massive global hub for these industries? That's what we really want to hear. Um, but thank you very much indeed for coming. We're enormously grateful.